morning. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Yahuru Williams received his PhD in history from Howard University. Today, he is the chair of the Department of History and the director of Black Studies at Fairfield University. Dr. Williams has published numerous books, including Teaching Beyond the Textbook, The Souls of Black Folk, and The Color Line Revisited. He recently appeared in the LA Progressive in an article entitled AstroTurf Activism and Corporate Education Reform, a detailed critique of the privatization forces at work in Philadelphia. I first came to know of Dr. Williams this past summer when I listened to a speech he gave to the badass teachers in Washington, D.C. His talk touched me very deeply, and I left feeling that this man had a profound understanding of the struggles we're experiencing here, and that he had a great deal to teach us. I immediately sent an email to him, and when he replied, I learned that while Dr. Williams teaches in Connecticut, he actually lives rather close to us here in New Jersey. And so we begin this work today with a word of inspiration from our good neighbor from across the bridge. Please join me in a warm welcome to Dr. Yvonne Williams. How are all of you today? Let's try that again. How are all of you today? Much, much better. I am going to do two things. I want to give you somewhat of a formal presentation, then I want to transition to a PowerPoint show. Then I want to bring some folks up who've joined me from the Badass Teachers. It feels strange saying that in the church, but when you're doing God's work, then you should be able to say Badass Teachers. All right. Amen? Amen. So let me briefly outline what I want to share with you this morning. First and foremost, I want to be clear. We have the power to transform education. I want to be clear because our schools are not failing. It is our democracy that is failing. And we need to address and correct that if we're going to be successful in our endeavors to preserve public education. Despite the rhetoric of the corporate education reformers, school reform is not the great civil rights issue of our time. Eradicating poverty which has contributed mightily to the conditions in our schools and communities is the great civil rights issue of our time. Mm -hmm. This is where our collective energies should lie. I would also like to say to you, and I'm glad to be in Philadelphia to share this, that we are in the midst of a great social revolution in America, in fact, in the world. Simply look to the East and pro-democracy rallies in China and the Middle East, and you see that we are in the context of a global challenge to these types of initiatives. But the problem is, while we suffer under the delusion of our democracy as well, it has never been in greater jeopardy. When you look at the School Reform Commission here in the city of Philadelphia, when you consider the fact that politicians are more beholden to the paychecks of the Koch brothers and Alec than they are responsive to the voices of the people, we need to make sure that our democracy will survive in the 21st century for our young people, and so we are here not only to do triage, but to do major surgery and reclaim our democracy for the future. So I say to you on this occasion, congratulations, Philadelphia. You sent a message to the education reformers that our democracy is viable. First you took to the streets, and then you took to the polls to reward your former governor, his faithfulness, faithlessness on education, <laughs> with a vote of no confidence. Your impudence inspired me to poetry. It's not very good, but I will share it anyway. <laughs> Farewell, Tom Corbett, the people let you know. When you undermine our schools, it's time for you to go. <laughs> Welcome, Governor Wolf. Your promises brought relief, but to ensure you're just not another wolf in sheep's clothing, we plan to keep you on a short leash. <laughs> Poetic justice aside, we can no longer afford to place such unbridled faith in politicians to 
protect our future. All right. We must get back to basics. We must first reclaim our democracy if we ever have a hope of reclaiming our schools. One of the things that I love most about the Caucus of Working Educators is the fact that it begins with we. We as, former, uh, we, as a former high school social studies teacher and passionate defender of music and arts in the curriculum, I love both the lyrical and rhetorical substance of we. We meaning you and I, meaning they and not us, meaning we the people. You cannot get more foundational than the aspirational language found in the preamble of the Constitution, a language that this body is right to appropriate as it seeks to transform politics. For the original preamble was written to address the age of the Enlightenment and what we need is a new age of Enlightenment and a revised preamble that speaks to the great issues of our time. What I love again about the Congress of, or Caucus of Working Educators is that we are addressing one of the problems that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King talked about in his lifetime. Rarely do we find men who are willingly engaged in hard, solid thinking. There's almost a universal quest for easy answers and half-baked solutions. That is what corporate education reform is. Easy answers and half-baked solutions. Not an intent to eradicate poverty, to look to the issues that divide us, to deal with the problems that are affecting our children and our students in ways that ultimately not only threaten their future, but our collective existence as a democracy, as a republic. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King continued, nothing pains some people more than having to think. Today is about thinking, but it's not just about thinking, it's also about action. Because at the end of the day, what we hope is that people will be inspired to do more than talk about the issues, but actually to actively engage in solutions that will bring about a change to our present condition. When I think about the ca caucus of working educators in the preamble, I think we could rewrite that preamble in this way. You could say this with me. Working educators, in order to preserve our what? Union. Mm -hmm. Restore. Justice. Regain. Domestic tranquility. Redefine. The common defense. Promote the people's welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and prosperity. Declare our intention to fight for our goals. Yes. That's our preamble. I both love and hate this image. It reminds me of the hope and change we thought we were going to get in 2008. It reminds me that the corporate education reformers are so insidious to appropriate the history and the language of the struggle for civil rights for their profitizing and privatization schemes. It shows Barack Obama sitting at the front of the bus and it's meant to approximate two major episodes in the history of civil rights in this country. Rosa Parks, but what kind of bus is it? Because it was both Rosa Parks' act of defiance and Brown versus Board of Education that historians typically locate the civil rights movement in. And yet, race to the top, like no child left behind before, has done more to promote segregation and inequality than to move us forward in our quest for racial equality and economic justice. We look at this image, and it reminds me of Thurgood Marshall, who, in the aftermath of Brown, laid out his vision of education. What Marshall said is, look, education is not teaching of the three R's. It's not about reading, writing, and arithmetic. Education, he said, is the teaching of overall citizenship, to learn to live together with fellow, fellow citizens, and above all, to learn to obey the law. I do not know of any more horrible destruction of the principle of citizenship than to tell young people in Little Rock that those of you who withdrew rather than go to school with Negroes, come back, all is forgiven. I don't know of any greater disservice to democracy than to say to the school reform board, to the politicians in Philadelphia, that you can abrogate a contract, you can undermine democracy, you can disobey the law, and come back, all is forgiven. No, all is not forgiven. This is about democracy. This is about justice. The corporate ed deformers, Arnie Duncan and John King and Michelle Rhee, are so comfortable trading in this language. And what they fail to realize, and the bats are, are, are proud of talking about this, is that unlike their agenda, we privilege three things. Number one, people over profits. 
Number two, parity over charity. And number three, choice over chance. So our vision of education is very different than their vision of education. When they talk about civil rights as being the great revolution of our time, what they fail to appreciate is that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King never would have agreed with their corporate education reform agenda. Now, how can you prove that, Dr. Williams? Because Arne Duncan just gave a speech three months ago where he talked about how the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King would have supported everything that he and Michelle Reed and John King and all these other clowns, excuse me, not the church, but clowns, <laughs> are promoting. In 1947, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, while still an undergraduate at Morehouse College, wrote a piece. I'm going to share with you that piece because there are elements of it that answer the question, what would Martin think about corporate education reform? What would Martin think about what's happening in Philadelphia? What would Martin think about what's happening in Ohio? What would Martin think about what's happening in New York? What would Martin think about what's happening in Kansas and in California? Martin's going to tell you. He began that essay, I too often find that most college men have a misconception of the purpose of education. Most of the brethren think that education should equip them with the proper instruments of exploitation. so that they can trample forever over the masses. Still others think that education should furnish them with noble ends rather than a means to an end. I think it's pretty clear what side we're on and what side our opponents are on. Martin Luther King continued, it seems to me that education has a twofold function to perform in the life of man and society. The one is utility and the other is culture. Now let's be clear, we're in a church. I feel like I'm going to start preaching up in here. I apologize if I do, but hey, it's the venue. I can't help it. <laughs> you say in the arts that you are not promoting culture. If you are not, if you do not have a If you do not have a range of academic interventions that allow students to express themselves in all ways, then you are not promoting culture. You cannot learn culture from filling out bubbles on a standardized test. by drawing murals than they will pre them preparing for a standardized test. We need to get back to that. This city is, is known for that. King continues, I love this. Education must enable a man to become more efficient to achieve with increasing facility the legitimate goals of his life. But education must also train one for quick, resolute, and effective thinking. To think incisively and to think for oneself is very difficult. We are prone to let our mental life become invaded by legions of half-truths prejudices and propagandas. I'd like to send that to Arne Duncan. <laughs> and your mayors. <laughs> At this point, I wonder whether or not education is fulfilling its purpose. Now, I want to be clear. King is not making the argument that the corporate education reformers make about we need to privatize our schools because they're failing, because our students aren't perform performing well on high stakes tests. King is saying we're failing because we're not contemplating on the great social issues of our day that could move us forward as a society and a culture. Watch this. King continues. A great majority of the so-called educated people do not think logically and scientifically. It was interesting that there was a poll that came out that showed that most people didn't hold teachers responsible for the debacle that took place here, and yet Tom Corbett got on television and kept saying, it's the teachers union that's responsible, as if people aren't smart enough to read up. <laughs> Even the press, the classroom, the platform, and the pulpit, in many instances, do not give objective and unbiased truths. Think about the collection of ministers and politicians, pundits, from all walks of life who've signed on and supported corporate education reform. Who, Mark Moriarty, I put their agencies behind this poison of privatization. To save man from the morass of propaganda, in my opinion, is one of the chief aims of education. Education must enable one to sift away evidence, to discern the truth from the false, the real from the unreal, and the facts from the fiction. The caucus of working educators is doing that here in Philadelphia. The badass teachers are doing that across the country. 
We is doing that across the country. But we have to do it independent of those traditional avenues which were available to us because they have been poisoned and corrupted. I was in Boston a few months ago for the Barack Obama and American Democracy Conference. Excuse me while I laugh. <laughs> And one of the ladies came up and she said, I work for a group and we're doing outreach to prisoners. And I said, that is wonderful. And she said, we'd love to have you speak. And I said, that's great, I'd love to do it. And she said, we'll be able to offer you a small honorarium. And I said, I would simply donate it back to you. And she says, well, don't worry about it. We're financed by the Koch brothers. Oh. <laughs> can't continue, therefore, is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. But education which stops with efficiency may prove the greatest menace to society. Do you hear me, test takers? The most dangerous criminal may be the man gifted with reason, but with no more. He went on to talk about Eugene Talmadge, who was governor of Georgia at that time. And King says all these wonderful things about Talmadge. He makes him sound like Arne Duncan and all these people with these billions of dollars and, and, and Ivy League degrees who want to pontificate about where we should be with regard to our schools, who want to come on television and smile at us in pretty suits and tell us about how privatization is going to save our kids, who sell us on the idea that charters, barters, and TFA martyrs are ultimately going to move this forward because untrained teachers in the classroom is the solution to highly qualified teachers. <laughs> King says about Talmadge, by all measures, Mr. Talmadge could think critically and intensively. Yet he contends that I'm an inferior being. Are those the types of men we call educated? Let me be clear. King says, we must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education. Of course, we don't have time for character education anymore. We're prepping for tests. The complete education gives one not only the power of concentration, but I want to emphasize this, tweet it, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. What worthy objective comes from concentrating on how one will perform simply on a test? King concludes, the broad education will therefore transmit to one not only the accumulated knowledge of the race, but also the accumulated experience of social living. I want to go back because he says, if we're not careful, our colleges will produce a group of closed-minded, unscientific, illogical propagandists. Hello. <laughs> Got it. He said in 1947, well, where are we today? These are some of the best trained, best educated, best equipped, best financed minds in the country. King continues, consume with immoral acts. Be careful, brethren. Be careful, teachers. Look at the corporate education reform industry and its lackeys, because they resemble exactly what the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King described. They come from both sides of the political aisle, liberal and neoliberal conservative. They mix up the same Kool-Aid. Our schools are in crisis. American students lag behind the rest of the world. They need curriculum rooted in STEM in order to be competitive. We say this in bats. We don't want to compete with the rest of the world. We want to work with the rest of the world. We want to heal the world. Competition created the Cold War. Competition fed Osama bin Laden. Competition ends up creating those conditions that force us to go to war because we can't make peace, because we're too busy worrying about competing. You can see, uh, I'm sorry. Our schools and teachers are inadequate, made so by tenure and powerful teaching unions that shield bad teachers and reduce accountability. It's hard not to laugh about that one because the fact of the matter is you wouldn't have had a civil rights movement if it wasn't for unions. Unions were the backbone of the civil rights movement. The reason why unions functioned so effectively or, or that unions were so effective in that capacity is because they allowed people to act without fear of being arbitrarily dismissed for their political activism. But they twist the history in such a way now to make it appear that somehow unions are the great enemy of people. 
Got to continue. Sorry. When King talks about creating a moral propaganda, I just got to step back. I'm not calling the brother immoral. I'm just saying. Arnie Duncan, Brooklyn, 2009. We should be able to look every second grader in the eye and say, you're on track, you're going to be able to go to college, or you're not. I think a look at what's in back here is beautiful. What's been erased from our school? Libraries, counselors, class sizes. I remember another came on and said, we reduced the number of buildings in Philadelphia. We've got it down. We're not at capacity. So the reason why you had those buildings, we needed those buildings because we need small class sizes. because they can shed light on what would make this work. But you're not listening to us. We want safe learning conditions, recess, nurses. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need computers. These people say, online education. They can just start pointing out how online education can actually become an agent of segregation. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Watch this. Governor Dan Malloy from my state of Connecticut. I don't mind teaching to the test as long as the test scores go up. Therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem. That's where you get the cheating, the repeating, the deleting, the misleading. Guys, I don't have to tell you, you're here. Corporate education reform is literally killing us. You know what happened here in Philadelphia? because we don't have nurses in our schools. But even at the university level, where we have people who are working under adjunct contracts, contingent faculties making $3,000 a course with no health care. 83-year-old woman right here in Pennsylvania died. 83 years old. Duquesne University, whose president is a foremost expert on health care. Health care and law and policy. And yet one of your faculty members drops dead in her driveway of a heart attack at 83 because you stripped her of the three courses she was teaching at $3,000 a year down to one course. So she couldn't pay her heat or hot water or her lights. And then you tell us that education is the great civil rights of our time and we want to ensure kids can go to college. And yet even in our colleges and universities, we're undermining basic human rights, basic social justice. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said it best in 1967 in his final book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, when he said, we made a big mistake in the civil rights movement by simply talking about opportunity. We should have been talking about economic justice. Because let's be clear, what good is it to have the right to eat in a restaurant if you can't afford anything on the menu? Civil rights without economic justice are dead rights. What good is it to have the right to go to college if you can't afford tuition? Civil rights without economic justice is well, it's unequal, inherently, therein lies the problem. But they drink the Kool-Aid. They persist in the Kool-Aid. They love the Kool-Aid. <laughs> I, I got to do this. I know I'm running out of time. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King also commented on sin. And I know some of you want to say, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in 1956 Talk about technology and its appropriate use in learning. This is what he said. Now as we face the fact of this new emerging world, we must face the responsibilities that come along with it. Not the competition, the responsibilities. I love this. A new age brings with it new challenges. Let's consider some of the challenges of this new age. First, we are challenged to rise above the narrow confines of our individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all what? Amen. Because see, I love, you can clap for the Reverend Dr. now. <laughs> because we know Twitter contributed to the era of strength. That's an effective use and innovative use of technology in helping people share information that ultimately helped to deepen and create opportunities for them to express their discontent with the government that did not meet their needs. That is a celebration of technology we can all get behind. The new world, he continues, is a world of geographical togetherness. I want you to think about this, because this is 1956. So he's, there's no internet. 
It took six hours to fly from New York. This is not the world that we live in where we have instant communication, and yet Kick, even in 1956, recognized the importance of all these things. He continues, this means that no individual or nation can live alone. We must all learn to live together or we will be forced to die together. This new world of geographical togetherness has been brought about to a great extent by man's scientific and technological genius. Man through his scientific genius has been able to dwarf distance and place time and change. He's been able to carve highways through the stratosphere. And yet, in our moment, rather than using that as a means to help our students who are struggling with ELL, rather than using that as an opportunity to say that we can slow down the year and offer a range of academic interventions that are organic to where our students are, rather than using those and employing those technologies in a way that help to deepen our students' understanding of math and science and technology and engineering, rather than forcing us to come up with ridiculous acronyms like STEAM <laughs> and system, social studies and fuse, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's not supposed to be that they're supposed to work in concert. It is the essence of a liberal arts education. It is pure personalis, care the whole person. That is what we are involved in. That is the nature of our endeavor. That is where education comes from. That is what it was born in, in the enlightenment. That is what fertilizes it. Everything else is crap. <laughs> and I said it in a church. <laughs> and it's on tape. <laughs> Guys, I say to you soberly that we find ourselves in the midst of a revolution. But what does that mean exactly? In his book, Six Years That Shook the World, W.R. Calls calls us to remember that revolutions are not simple affairs that are easily concluded. They are long traumatic affairs that tear apart societies and flip change on a scale unanticipated at the time leading up to the revolution. And the question for all of us is if we're willing to pay the call. Powerful thing about that is that here in Philadelphia, the revolution has been going on since 1981, since that great effort to undermine the teacher. This is the cradle of liberty. It is the birthplace of America. It's interesting when we talk about the civil rights movement because you can't escape Philadelphia. You'll talk about it in the American Revolution. You talk about it during the civil rights movement. What are you talking about? Well, Philadelphia, Mississippi is where they found those three civil rights workers, Ferber, Cheney, and Goodman, which led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which if Pennsylvania had not supported, I mean, you can do the work. But now we come to 2014, and we see students of color out in the streets we see teachers out in the streets demanding for a just democracy, contending for a just democracy, and we have to take a step back and say, what the hell did we mean when we said that these truths we hold to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their favorite certain inalienable rights among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit not of Alec, <laughs> not of property, but of happiness. Now how do we define that? Not what the Koch brothers do with Eli Ward does. This is our democracy. This is our city. This is our country. These are our children. This is our world. Either we stand and claim it, and we fight for it, or we retreat, and we allow it to work. In China, they had this up, and it spoke to me. They said they can't kill us all in China. But here in the United States, they silence us with such a... They can't silence us all. They can't hide what's happening here. It's funny because when I look at the Congress, uh, I'm sorry, the caucus, I always want to call you guys the Congress. Maybe it's the Philadelphia thing. <laughs> Maybe it's all the conversation about democracy that gets me worked up. But I'm telling you, that's what I want to call you. I don't want to call you that because I think the work is important. Because I wish I was here on a daily basis to work with you, because I believe that, and I'm going to be very clear, Philadelphia is the canary in the mind as Philly goes, so the
National Council for the Social Studies identifies core democratic values for elementary students. This is funny. This is what the National Council for the Social Studies says. We should be teaching elementary students. I got to go through this. It's great. Number one, life. Each citizen has a right to the protection of their life, not ALEC and stand your ground laws. That's not what we're talking about. But life meaning the opportunity to have an education that meets the need of those communities. Liberty, I'm sorry, the pursuit of happiness. Each citizen can find happiness in their own way as long as they do not infringe on the rights of others. Liberty, I love this. Liberty includes the freedom to believe what you want, freedom to choose your own friends, to express your ideas and opinions in public, the right for people to meet in groups, ha ha. <laughs> And the right to have a lawful job or business and a union to support you in it. <laughs> Justice. All people should be treated fairly and getting advantages and disadvantages of the country. Popular sovereignty. Really? For third graders? Absolutely. What does it mean? The power of the government comes from who? The people. And we are the people. Truth. The government and citizens should not lie. Somewhere the earth is moving. <laughs> Common good. Citizens should work together for the good of all. The government should make laws that are good for everyone. Hear that, Alex? <laughs> Equality. Everyone should be treated the same. Diversity. Difference in language, race, religion, dress, food, and heritage are not only allowed but accepted as important, which means that if we're disregarding our non English speakers, then we should think real hard about what it means to be part of a democracy if we're going to pretend that that's not an issue in the range of ways that affects non-English speakers beyond the black and white divide. Thanks. Patriotism, a devotion to our country and our core democratic values. If I look at we, it's interesting. Um, Member-driven union, we work to respond, represent, and amplify the voice of our members. It goes back to these core democratic values. Transparency, accountability, shared decision, publicly funded education, transform cur curriculum and autonomy to teach, not test, education for all, and a support of unions. If I'm looking at that, I'm telling you, because this is what makes me excited, then what I see in we is our DNA, our dreams, how we nurture those dreams, and ultimately how we act upon those dreams, because what we see in we is literally the genetic code of American democratic practice. We don't see it in the mayor's office. We don't see it in the governor's office. We don't see it in Washington, D.C. We don't see it in Allen. We don't see it any place but among we the people. But when I look at Tiananmen Square in 1989, and I look at Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, I got to tell you that there are pro-democracy rallies taking place right now here in the United States. We just don't see them that way. Because in a sense, there's another flavor of cooling that we enjoy. We are so ready, rightfully so, to talk about the abuse of women in the Middle East. And we should. It is important. And we should celebrate the fact that this young girl stood up and fought for education. But why is it the same people that want to talk about this and celebrate this and write that they should don't want to celebrate Philadelphia students for marching in the streets for their teachers? <laughs> ought to be put in jail. Those kids should be in school. I can't believe that those, you know, the teachers would encourage that. You mean that we would encourage democracy? That we would encourage kids to vote with their feet for freedom? That they might actually take some of the lessons that we managed to teach even though we were supposed to be testing? <laughs> the heart? I won't apologize for that. <laughs> Our police look like an occupier. Our schools look like prisons. Our democracy looks like a totalitarian regime. 
Now is the time for us to act. This is the fierce urgency of now that the Reverend Dr. Martin can talk about. Tomorrow is not acceptable. Yesterday is gone. All we have is this moment. All we have is each other. We can take heart from the fact that the battle in Kansas and the battle in Philadelphia and the battle in Ohio share certain consistencies, but, and I suggested this at the National uh, MPE, let's be clear, the old PTA doesn't work. We gotta rethink it, it's gotta be national. It's gotta be on Facebook and Twitter. We gotta let these folks know whenever they mess with us, whenever they mess with us, that we're gonna respond, and we're gonna respond with such a mighty war that they're not gonna be able to ignore us. That we're gonna be able to shake the state house in Harrisburg and the state house in Trenton and even the White House. That we're not going to be content with a black president, a Latina president, or a white female president. We don't want a president. We want justice. Mm -hmm. Let me wrap up. Oh, Alec. <laughs> oh, Alec again. Oh, Alec. We don't have any more room for American tragedies. At the turn of the century, America's inability to deal with working conditions led to tragedy and lack of tragedy. During the civil rights era, the period before the lynching, the American tragedy because we fit. We don't, we can't on this issue. The stakes are too high. The prize is too great. Our children need that much. Christopher Eisberg, who teaches at Princeton, has written, American government aspires to be both democratic and just. I love this. To insist that justice and democracy coincides makes heavy, but we may hope not impossible demands upon the American people. You can have a just democracy. You can. We can. Until evidence forces us to give up the hope for a just democracy, the constitutional enterprise compels us to treat that hope as reasonable. And when people believe that the hope is reasonable, you know what they do? They don't give up their seat on the segregated funds, even though segregation has been in force since 1896. <laughs> what people do, they say, well, oh, school reform commission has all the power, but so what? We're going to go march in the street. You know what they do? They make sure that Tom Corbett can't come to the city of Philadelphia. We got to sneak in. <laughs> children deserve, I gotta wrap up. What do our children deserve very quickly? Our children deserve not to get a zombie education. They deserve not to have to be out in the streets. What our children deserve, what our children deserve is a word wall. I'm gonna say that again. What our children deserve is a word wall that lays out the cornerstones of the, of the type of education will empower them. That education must be democratic. It must be egalitarian. Our schools must be not just places of learning, but centers of service, because we're spelling out the word deserve. And by that, I mean that our schools should be essential in the sense that they're not just places where kids take tests and are prepared to go to college or not, Arnie Duncan. What they are, the nucleus of the That's what they've always been. They should be engaging. They should be respected. Stop already with the narrative of failure. Stop already with the, the challenges on teachers. It's interesting that you expect students to go to school and respect the very teachers that night, on, night by night on the nightly news, some politician stands up and blames for all the problems in the country. How do you expect young people to respect us and what we do if you constantly undermine us by talking about what we're not? And oh, by the way, respect our students as well. By not reducing it to the test. By not calling the schools fail. By not closing the schools. By not undermining their communities. By stop firing their parents. Stop robbing even the idea that they can go to college because there's not enough scholarship money for everybody. 
So what kind of game are you playing? Our schools should be versatile and they should be empowering. Let me say, I was going to go into this whole thing about the prison boom and the pipeline, but I don't have time for that. Where I want to end with you is with Chester Community Charter, we don't want to be cheaters, we want to be leaders. Period. That's what we want from our schools. We don't want to be online, we want to be real time. Ultimately, what we want is not for our schools to, be fun to funnel the business and economic interest of corporations. We want our schools to reflect our DNA. We want our schools to empower our young people to perfect our democracy and this great endeavor begun so many years ago in this city by people whose names we venerate. Jefferson, Franklin, Washington. You got a national constitution set and a governor that has a nerve to impose a rule that is so undemocratic that it makes one sick to the stomach to think that it exists in the United States of America. <laughs> Our DNA is the civil rights movement. I love this picture of Rosa Parks. Some of you know this joke already, but you know why that deputy is looking so closely at Rosa Parks right now? Because I think he found Abigail Adams' DNA <laughs> up under Rosa Parks' fingernail. Because what he found in Rosa Parks was a woman like my good friend Melissa Tomlinson, who's here from the Badass Teachers, who when Governor Christie was saying all this craziness about failure factories, Melissa said, well, it's a democracy and I have right to speak, so she went to see Chris Christie. Middle school teacher from, from, Chris Christie don't know her from Adam. And when Chris opened his mouth, Melissa stepped up and said, excuse me, Governor, why do you persist in calling our school factories a failure? You know what he did? He yelled at her. You want to know why? Because he's a bully. <laughs> because he should have read that book, Everything I Needed to Know About Life, I Learned in Kindergarten. But when Alec is funding you, you don't have to be responsive. You don't have to be respectful. You don't have to be civil. You don't have to act like you care about the people. You don't have to privilege democracy. You can be as nasty as you want to be, because at the end of the day, you believe that you can subvert the democratic process. Not so with us. This democracy is ours. This is our country. These are our schools. We'll fight against poverty. We'll fight against injustice in all its forms. We'll fight against violence. We'll fight against indifference. We want to correct. We want our students to concentrate on why the United States is the world's leading jailer. Mm -hmm. That's what we want our students to think about. How do we do this better? Why are we warehousing human beings? Those are the great social issues that our students should be reflecting on, not how to fill out a bubble tag. I'm out of time, but I would say, and I have a piece coming out in the, not the LA progressive, but the real progressive on this. What would Martin Luther King say if he were alive today? I think if that statue they erected to him down in DC could see, and I'd be the first one to run at that happen. But I think <laughs> if that statue could speak, you'd find Martin Luther King doing exactly what this cartoon is portrayed about. He'd be on his way to Wall, Occupy Wall Street. That was a couple years ago. Let me change that. He'd be on his way to Philly. He'd be right here. What would he say if he could walk through this door? He would say to you, almost always the creative, dedicated minority has made the world better. We, the Caucus of Working Educators, is the dedicated minority. The Badass Teachers Association is the dedicated minority. Moore is the dedicated minority. The American Federation of Teachers is the dedicated minority. We are the people. We will reclaim democracy. We will fight for justice. We are coming to take our school. I'm going to have uh, my colleagues from BATS come up. Is Denisha here? Dr. Jones? Aixa? I just want them to 
Because we're staying all day. I go, we have things to learn from you. I mean, there are a couple of panels here I can't wait for. Like, opt out, I'm all over that. Aww. These are my colleagues. Denisha, Aisa, and Mel Tomlinson. So if anybody has any questions, statements, comments, let's just talk for a few minutes and a few minutes that we have left. Yeah, a few minutes we have left. Nothing? Nothing? Got my brain trust. I can't answer any questions. <laughs> Right there. This is Frank Gordon. I'm from the Jesuit University here in Philadelphia, and I'm, uh, my imagination is stimulated and, and a little bit embarrassed to see the enthusiasm that, that the academic community is running here. I'm curious if you can make some suggestions about how universities might plug in to this effort and go shoulder to shoulder with the teacher. Start. I'm a professor at Howard University and just drove down, sorry I was late, but three hours from DC. Um, and I think for me, what works well is we use our mission and all of this work ties into our mission. So it's really easy for me to put this in my courses when our mission is to eradicate the research that makes black, black and brown children failures and their families failures. So I think, and most schools might not have a, that broad of a mission as Howard, but you have something in there that speaks to educating all children, democracy, and so you use that and say, this is, this is what I'm here for, you know? I, I have to do this, and I think it, it works. I'm fortunate to have a wonderful dean, Dean Fenwick, who supports the work of um, critical scholarship and critical research and advocacy, but um, if I didn't, I would use the school's mission to kind of force that on them and see what they do. And you know, some universities might not, but others are, they, what I've learned is they like that one person does it. They're not gonna make the whole faculty do it, but my chair is like, well, you do it, so that's great, and then the students will get it from you, and we don't have to worry about it. And I'll take that for now, you know, it works. I, I have the same reaction as Denisha. I'm not Howard alum, but I went to Jesuit school. I went to the University of Scranton, so I'm, Pennsylvania's home for me. And as a product of Jesuit education and someone who recognizes the unique mission that the Jesuits tend to project, we in particular have an, an opportunity to use that mission to advance this notion of justice, particularly in education. And I do it all the time. I actually made a job change. I'm no longer a chair of the history department and director of black studies. I'm now associate vice president of academic affairs. So I shouldn't be making speeches like this. But if anyone were ever to ask me a question about why I felt comfortable in doing it, I would simply point to the mission of our institution and say, we are obliged to move the needle on justice. This is what the Jesuits talk about. And so at the end of the day, the mission and identity of the college itself, or the university itself, with its appeal to cure personalities. The one I love is we love, you know, Jesuits love old Latin terms. So we have this thing called eloquentia perfecta, the good person speaking and acting justly. So today is just eloquentia perfecta. <laughs> created with BATS and working with Moore and working with Wait, we've created kind of that um, 
that new wave of getting the message out there through social media and like he said, ignoring the typical outlets that are poisoned right now. So, you know, as we develop, we're creating those political committees that are going to start working towards trying to steer elections more for public education. We're creating um, and helping out with businesses like this. Like the whole time he was on, I was on Twitter and we have 14,000 Twitters. And that's what everybody needs to do. You, you need to attack those outlets that are not controlled, that the people have the control of and utilize them to the best advantage. Any type of organization that's like this, any type of event that's like this, we all need to work together to share the message and say, hey, this is what this group is doing. Maybe you want to take this model or this idea and bring it to your state. I was at the New Jersey State Convention and I had a booth and we had over just 300 people alone sign up within two days. Something like that, somebody can do in another state. It's just these conversations that we continuously have, sharing ideas, trying again and again to see what takes until we're all brought together on the same page. Also, um, I wanted to kind of both the, the college one and, and the second question. Um, colleges are being literally targeted for programs such as TFA, and um, a lot of people are starting to realize that they're graduates are getting to a situation where they didn't anticipate being dropped off after five weeks of training into a very difficult school and many quit. Um, this is not what the college is intended for them to do. So that what, pushing back against those type of scab training, that's what colleges need to do. Mm -hmm. Push back. Mm -hmm. Do not allow them to recruit at mm -hmm. your school. Mm -hmm. Because it's not teach for a while. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll, I'll put in another piece, it's really painful for a lot of kids to be told that you got a new teacher and these people leave and the turnover is big. And why is it that someone from Utah is qualified after five weeks to come into the South Bronx and they're supposed to be better than anybody who is homegrown, pushing out teachers of color. So to see a whole entire school or school system, all of a sudden everybody's in their 20s and everybody's white there's an agenda. That's right. Schools need to push back on that. Secondary, talking like this is great, um, but you can do stuff even on a small level. Not a lot of people feel like they can, but buy all those wonderful documentaries that are talking about this. Share it with small groups. Do screenings if you have the connection. Because we're, we're preaching to the choir here. We all agree here. We're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you need to inform others and you need to build that understanding. Once you actually speak to someone and they get the idea, but they may think, oh, you're a teacher, you have a vested invest, you have a, a, a reason to feel this way. But when they start actually seeing the movie, seeing the literature and connecting things, their minds change. We have to control the narrative. And if it means getting a screening together and inviting the ladies at the, the hair salon, okay, inviting the people at your church to see standardized to see any of those films that are, and there's more coming out to talk about what's really happening because those people will gossip is the best social media is it not <laughs> gossip is an incredible social media because that's what twitter is gossip in 140 characters right <laughs> okay that's what it is um and if you can pop take the the take the power of word of mouth because you have to change hearts one by one you know, and people love to give information when they think they know something someone else doesn't know. Oh, you haven't seen this movie. Yeah. You have to see this documentary. And so if you can empower a couple of big mouths, target them. Facts. No joke. Target them specifically. The people who are very boisterous, very social, like to get attention, those people spread the word fast. Target those people. Inform them. We, got, we have to end on that note, unfortunately, but I like that target a bunch of big mouths. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, we are th thrilled to be here with you today. It is my honor to be in the city of Philadelphia with we, and we're just looking forward to a great day, so thank you for having us. Yeah. Um, 